this. Hi everyone, it's Ken Rakowski. Welcome to Metal Mentoring, where we get to meet one of the most amazing people on the planet. Aubrey DeGray is joining us. I met Aubrey uh, back in uh, 2007 when he was one of the speakers at the Soul Digital Forum. And uh, Koreans, of course, like to live forever. At least they like to think they do. Their kimchi is supposed to give them some form of life extension. And when Aubrey sat down with them, he blew their mind. Even back 13 years ago, he was at, way ahead of his time. I am so happy to have him join us. I met him, I believe, at TED Med in 2006 with Jesse Dillon, actually, who introduced us back then. So, Aubrey, thank you very much for hanging out with us, and I really appreciate you sharing time with us today. Well, likewise, it's my pleasure. Okay, let's first talk, elephant in the room, the beard. Come on. What is the question? Is that the personal branding? Is it, is it what is it? Is it to keep you looking young? What is the yeah, beard? Uh, no, it's very boring. My ex-wife campaigned for it 30 years ago when uh, we first got together and, um, you know, uh, she's a beard fan, so I, so I eventually grew one. And uh, here it is. You know, it became a bit of a trademark, I guess, but it's low maintenance. Um, you know, it doesn't get in the way. And um, that's all. All right, let's talk about as we get old, what really becomes the hindrance of age? what really first what we might physically see but internally what makes us theoretically feel old well of course it's not theoretical um what makes us get old you know what changes in our bodies is it, it's actually changes to the composition of the body the molecular and cellular structure and composition of the body is of course as with any machine however complicated the machine may be um it that is what defines the function of the body and therefore, the, um, uh, the, the changes that happen, the damage that accumulates uh, over time, eventually comes to exceed the amount of damage that the body is set up to tolerate. And that's why late in life we go downhill. And, but what specifically is it? Is it just be cell breakdown? What is it? So, of course, it's not just one thing. Any machine, even a simple machine like a car, has... A variety of different types of damage that accumulate and of course the human body therefore has a huge number of types of damage. Um, the only real reason why we can say today that it is reasonable to suppose that we might actually be able to uh, do something about that is because first of all we can classify those many 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 types of damage into a manageable number of categories that are amenable each, each within each category maybe many examples, but all amenable to the same kind of therapy. Um, and also there's a certain amount of crosstalk between the categories, which helps. Uh, but yeah, I mean, the types of damage are very diverse. They are things like um, loss of cells, cells dying and not being automatically replaced by the division of other cells. That's a big thing in certain aspects of aging, like Parkinson's disease, for example. It's also important in the decline of the immune system with age, which of course is a big deal right now with COVID. Mm -hmm. um, then there's accumulation of waste products, just garbage that the cell generates as byproducts of normal metabolic processes. Most of the garbage that the body generates, it has evolved ways to either break down or to excrete, and that's all wonderful. Um, but uh, there are certain ones that accumulate really slowly, so slowly that basically evolution doesn't care about them, and so we don't have ways to either break them down or to excrete them. And those are the ones that uh, eventually cause problems late in life, things like atherosclerosis or macular degeneration. And again, we've, you know, we've got to find ways to fix these things. Wow, that's great. By the way, guys, you have a question, comment, or idea, please put it in the chat and we'll make sure that you're part of this conversation, but please include and jump in at any point in time. What was the catalyst behind this for you, Aubrey, to get, get into this space? Well, actually, there's a very simple answer to that question. I discovered that basically nobody else was working on it. So I always throughout my whole life, even starting from a young kid, I knew that what I wanted to do with my life was to make a difference, to work on the most important problems for humanity and see what I could contribute. And uh, I started out working in artificial intelligence research because I felt that one of the problems that was really quite substantial was the problem of work, the fact that People have to spend so much of their time doing stuff that they would not do unless they were being paid for it. Um, and so obviously we need more automation. And so I thought I'd work on that because I found when I was 15 that I was really good at programming. And I thought, you know, that's something I can do. Um, but I always knew, even from the earliest age, that 
the problem of work was by no means the number one problem for humanity. The number one problem was obviously aging, mm -hmm. um, because it kills people, you know, it makes people sick and causes far more suffering than anything else. Um, and, you know, the only reason I didn't work on that from, uh, from the beginning was because I didn't have any reason to believe I would be a particularly exceptional biologist. And I had presumed that people who were exceptional biologists would think the same way and would be working on it. And it was only when I was around 30 that I found out, actually through my ex-wife, that I was wrong about that. That actually she and all the other biologists I met through her uh, actually thought that aging was rather uninteresting and unimportant and not their problem. And I was completely blindsided by this. I had no idea, but after a couple of years, I kind of came to terms with it and decided, well, I've got no choice really, I've got to work on this. So here I am. Well, we know that death is the number one cause of death, without a doubt, we can't change that. But as we start to look at things that to start to prolong death in a happy way, meaning happy life, we want to be healthy and happy. We don't want to do, live to be an old age, but being you know, <laughs> crippled and decrepit and anything like that. Is there anything short term that we could do without doing ingestibles besides exercise? Is there anything we can do that we may not be doing to live a longer, healthier life? Well, the first thing we can do is to be careful with our terminology. You know, it doesn't help to say things like death is the number one cause of death. Um, it doesn't even help to say that, you know, um, uh, can, can Google cu uh, cure death, which is the front, which was the front page headline of the Time magazine uh, uh, issue that announced the formation of Calico. You know, the f fact is the reason why that's a problem, you know, to conflate the word aging and the word death is because people have a lot of problems with the idea of getting rid of death. They say things like, you know, death gives meaning to life and, you know, uh, stuff like that. And, you know, whether or not there's any truth in that, the point is we're not working on stopping death. Um, we might be working on postponing death, but death is still definitely going to be a reality from other causes that don't have to do with how old we are or how sick we are. Okay. So I think it's really rather important to be clear about all that. What we can do at the moment in terms of, um, you know, how we can stay healthy. Well, of course, this is not the area that I work on. I work on stuff that we can't do yet on developing new therapies that don't yet exist. And I don't have anything particularly original to say about what we can do already other than, you know, what everyone knows, you know, don't get seriously overweight, uh, you know, don't smoke, that kind of stuff. Um, and the reason I don't, of course, is because other people are working on this very effectively and are able to, you know, to analyze people and pick out the individual differences between people that determine what works for some people and not for others. The big thing that I always want to emphasize is that on the one hand, absolutely do what you can to postpone the health problems of late life. Try and find out as much as you can about your own biology and about what you need to pay attention to. But at the same time, never forget that the, in the best possible case, however much you do, there's only a modest amount that you can actually postpone that health issue, those health issues by the therapies and the lifestyle and diet and so on that exist today. Right. We will not be able to do any better, we do significantly well, like even as much as 10 years of postponement, not for most people anyway, without developing new therapies. And that's one of the more unique things because we've gone from extending life 200 years ago, almost 25 years, and then the last 100 years, another 10 years, and now things have actually slowed down. We haven't been able to really enhance life more than three or five years. So there has to be some breakthrough. I'm wondering some of the stuff that we're able to buy, even through an Amazon environment like NAD, uh, anything that is readily available right now, can it improve life or extend life on what's available today over the counter? Yeah, a little bit, maybe for some people, is the short answer. Let me give a slightly longer answer, though, because I can. Um, <laughs> and let me do that focusing on NAD, since you brought it up. So NAD is a really great example of a, a chemical that can be used to trick the body into thinking that it's not getting enough food, that it's in a famine. Of course, in our, our evolution, before civilization, Famines were rather common. And 
the result, of course, is, is that evolution had figured out ways to optimize the response to famine, to, um, you know, to maximize the uh, ability to pass on genes. And it turns out that famine imposes, well, it shifts the priority. If you're in a famine, then there's not much point in having offspring because those offspring will start to death before they have their own offspring. So it makes sense to kind of shift your metabolic priorities in favor of hunkering down and getting through the famine or giving yourself the best chance to get through it so that you can have those offspring when times are better. All right, so conversely, if there is enough food, it makes sense to have your offspring as quickly as possible because you might get eaten by a tiger in the meantime. Otherwise, you shouldn't delay. Always a problem. Right, exactly. <laughs> it used to be. Um, so um, people got very excited about this back in the, well, nearly a century ago, actually. The 1930s was when, when this really started become a, becoming a research topic. Um, because it, 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 what it translates into is that if you take mice in the laboratory, or rats or whatever, and you feed them less than they would like, you impose an artificial famine on them, then they live a lot longer than they otherwise would, maybe 50% longer if you do it just right. And that would be wonderful. But um, the thing is, it doesn't work so well for long-lived species, which is no surprise if you think about it, because you know, whether you're a long-lived species or a short-lived species, the, you know, the distribution of famines in terms of time frame is the same. You know, long famines just don't happen very often. And therefore, evolution doesn't take the trouble to get you through long famines. Um, so we only get a modest effect from famine, from imposing artificial famine. However, we get something. Uh, so that means that it's good to, 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 to do things like calorie restriction and intermittent fasting. However, of course, a lot of people find that difficult because, you know, food is nice. So... <laughs> the idea of these supplements like nicotinamide riboside or NMN or metformin or rapamycin, most of the um, basis, the scientific basis for these things is to essentially pretend to be in a famine, to essentially uh, inhibit the body's ability to detect the level of nutrients that are being uh, eaten um, or for that matter to metabolize those nutrients. And that, you know, that has the same effect. It turns on the same genes, turns off the same genes, so as to implement this, as I say, this um, shift in metabolic priorities. Ah. And that's all great. But as I say, it's not the Holy Grail. It only gives you a modest amount in humans. Got it. All right, let's go with uh, Rick. I'm going to let you ask the first question, Rick. I am unmuting you. You got the mic. Go for it, Rick. Oh, no, I, you, did, ju you just mentioned metformin. And I was just wondering what your take was on metformin. Right. Yes, yeah, so another, another. Well, okay, let me, do that first, and then, let me do that first, and then let me get you to talk more. So, um, okay. yeah, metformin, as I said, is basically one of this family of drugs that um, appears to have some kind of what, what's called CR mimetic, calorie restriction mimetic effect. In other words, it does more than what it was originally um, approved for, which was to treat diabetes. It seems to have a general anti aging effect, but the effect is likely to be rather small. Go ahead, then. What else were you going to ask? No, I, I'm just curious because, uh, you know, there's different dosing and people are advocating for it. I'm a physician, but I don't take it. But I just wanted to know somebody who's more well-informed. than I, my, my other question, do you take metformin? That would be one question, if you don't mind me asking. Yeah, I don't take anything. Okay, that's good. I, I, neither do I, so that's good. <laughs> but, but let me explain why I don't take anything, because this is not a recommendation to other people not to take anything. Yeah, right. Um, the reason I don't is because I seem to be doing very well the way I am. Uh, so, you know, everyone's different metabolically, as any physician would know. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, different things work for different people. Some people uh, may have you know, drawn genetic or epigenetic short straws such that they are accumulating one particular type of damage in the body at an unusually rapid rate. Mm -hmm. um, and that is something that can, I believe, be substantially normalized by... Uh, the simple medicines that we have today, if you get it just right. Ray yeah. Kurzweil is a great example, a high profile person of this type. He came down with type two diabetes in his thirties, which as you know, is not terribly common. And he's basically fixed it completely. He's 70 now or so, thereabouts, and he's had no diabetes ever since he developed his rather famous regimen of taking about 200 supplements a day. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, people like me are at the opposite end of the spectrum. I always come out ridiculously young for my age. 
and therefore I have to take the view that if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And, you know, um, remember that medicine is fundamentally black magic and, you know, we should probably not be messing with things that are uh, working fine. So what's, what's the best way of estimating your biological age? Oh, well, that's changing a lot over time. So I've had that kind of thing measured uh, maybe half a dozen times now over the past 20 years. And I still very much believe to some extent in the traditional approaches of just measuring, first of all, an awful lot of things in your blood, everything that changes, you know, insulin, insulin resistance, um, you know, peroxide levels, uh, LDL, HDL, the usual things that everyone's heard of. Plus also, of course, functional tests, cognitive, physiological, um, you know, gait speed, grip strength, the usual things. I think that the, that still has enormous value that will never go away. And of course, aggregating all of those, all of those metrics into one number is you know, very subjective, really. Yeah, it is. But that's okay. That's okay. If you're doing well on all of them, then you know you're doing well. Um, now, of course, the, the reason I say this is changing over time is because right now we have a huge amount of research hitting the streets, which is focused on big data, on um, sequencing one's whole genome and epigenome and metabolome and proteome and detecting things that change with everybody over time and figuring out a metabolic, uh, sorry, a biological age that way. And this is still um, very much a research area. I wouldn't say it has by any means reached the point of true reliability, but it's improving rapidly. So this may be the method of choice fairly soon for measuring one's biological age. What about longevity genes? Well, so, okay. So, of course, longevity genes, as in genetic variants that seem to predispose to either a short lifespan or a long lifespan, are just part of how you get to where these biological clocks and functional measures actually, um, actually measure. They, so so you, if, if you've got, for example, uh, APOE4 allele, then a, a, a little four of apo, apo lipoprotein E, then you are clearly un, unequivocally more likely to get Alzheimer's disease and indeed uh, atherosclerosis at an earlier age than if you don't have apo E4. Um, so that's the classic longevity gene. Um, mm -hmm. But the, uh, and there are a number of others that have been discovered in the past few years. Apo E4 was discovered to have this role uh, more than 25 years ago. The reason there was such a gap between, before the second one was discovered is because everything else except APOE appears to have a really tiny effect. So, of course, it's all additive. There's lots and lots of different genes, each of which has a tiny effect. And if you get lucky and you have a lot of the good ones, then great. But, as I say, tiny effects. So, um, you know, not really the thing to focus on. That's the very last question, and that is, do you have uh, the best reason? I mean, some, some people listening may not have a, a, a medical background, and that, oh, there's a lot of information to take in. Do you have like a general reading article about that or uh, the best resource for estimating biological age? Oh, well, both that and indeed everything else about what's going on, what's coming down the pike. You know, our website, sense.org, is a pretty good resource, I, well, I'd say it myself. Um, I'm it, sure it is. <laughs> it, it, it's got documentation for absolutely every type of audience, from absolute experts all the way through to complete novices. And um, of course, you know, there's, there's um, all about all the stuff about what we ourselves are doing at Sense Research Foundation, lots of news about what's coming along from elsewhere in this uh, increasingly large community of researchers and, you know, stuff about what's happening outside of the research and advocacy and such like. Um, and of course, there's also a contact form. So if there's a question that you can't find the answer to, you're perfectly um, welcome to ask us and we're very good at replying to those. Plus, there's also, of course, a nice big friendly donate button. There you go. That's an important one. The donate button is the most important. And that's one of the reasons why we're here also, to support what you're doing. Uh, you. Do you know um, Nathaniel Neal? I mean, Nathaniel David? Are oh, yeah, very well. Good friend. Oh, you do. So, you know what? Are you familiar with what they're doing there over at Unity? Because yep. So, uh, let me basically just summarize. So, for those of you who don't know, Unity Biotechnology is a company focused on developing drugs to eliminate senescent cells. So, normally when I talk about um, the whole you know, uh, spectrum of types of damage in aging, I split it into nine different categories, and that's one of the categories. Uh, senescent cells are basically cells that have got into a, a, a kind of aberrant state, a dysfunctional state where they're doing more harm than good, and they, um, you know, they... Um, 
don't go away. In fact, most of them do go away. The immune system is fairly good at getting rid of such cells, but it's not perfect. So some of them survive and accumulate over time. And yes, so drugs have been identified that appear to promote the suicide of these cells. And that's what Unity does. Uh, Unity are the leading company in this space, but they're by no means the only one. There are lots and lots, because it's definitely a very big area that has very solid research behind it. Um, so Unity were the first one to get into clinical trials, and they chose osteoarthritis as their first indication. Um, that may not have been the ideal choice in hindsight, but it was a good choice. And um, they, they uh, published extremely promising phase one results about a year and a bit ago, a year and a half ago, maybe. Um, the, uh, yeah, the, 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 that, that was really exciting. You know, phase one, of course, is normally just a very small number of people. They're only really looking for safety data. Um, but the effect was sufficiently strong that they were able to say at least tentative things about efficacy, which is fantastic. Um, they went straight into phase two, of course, and the phase two turned out to be a bust. That reported uh, quite recently, a month or two ago. And, uh, you know, um, that's a shame. Uh, essentially, if you look at the data closely, you can see that there was an enormous placebo effect. And, you know, maybe the study could have been designed differently in hindsight. Um, but the fact is, you have to remember always that a clinical trial is a scientific experiment. It's uh, obviously a very expensive one, but it is still an experiment. And so sometimes they work, sometimes they don't work. And sometimes they do neither. They were just... heavily funded, heavily funded. Jeff well, Bezos but, yeah. money. I was going to come to that. So that's a really good thing. So because senescent cells really have a very solid scientific basis as part of aging and senolytics, the drugs that fix them have a very solid basis as a beneficial effect. Um, that means that, yes, Unity have a lot of money in the bank, which is allowing them to proceed with a number of other clinical um, pipe pipelines. They've got a couple more in the go on the go. Phase one already ongoing right now. Um, so, you know, I think the stage is set for Unity to continue to be a big player, even though, of course, their share price took a complete hit when that phase two result came out. Yeah, it's true. Let's go over to Marco. Well, Mark actually, before anything else, can I just go through the questions that are appearing in the chat? Well, so that's where I was going to go to. I, I like when they ask the questions directly, so I'm going to go to Marco, who's got yeah, the next one. Marco, go ahead, Marco. Thank you. So um, do you sit on the board of any biotechnology company? Do you advise any biotech companies? Yeah, so I don't sit on any boards of directors at all. I totally swear by never having any fiduciary responsibility for anybody, whether that's a company or a nonprofit or anything. However, I advise absolutely everybody, you know, just because I've been around <laughs> a long time, uh, you know, I'm the top Google hit, people come to me all the time. And so, yes, absolutely, I do advise everybody. There's a good question right there. And Marco, since you are a chemist, that's all that Marco done. Marco is a chemist and he likes everything around uh, nanotechnology. Yes. Uh, I, I, was so Aubrey, I, I was actually putting another question in the chat. Maybe, maybe I can ask it directly. Go ahead. Go ahead. Now, um, you know, when we donate blood, let's say I donate a pint of blood, then my body needs to make new blood. Yep. So does donating help retaining some youth because my body needs to make new blood, fresh, you know, clean blood? Yeah, it's a great question. It's very topical right now because the um, process of replacing blood uh, by young blood is actually something that, again, has been giving very, very promising results in the laboratory and it's moved on to the clinic. And in fact, um, just to come back for a moment to the commercial situation, because I talked about Unity Biotechnology a moment ago, um, rather um, fortuitously, just like one week after Unity reported this really bad news and everyone was scared that it would really spook the whole sector in terms of investment, just one week later, one of the leading companies focusing on this young blood business um, uh, went, uh, uh, got acquired. Uh, so it, it, it was bought by a company in Europe for a uh, valuation of more than a quarter of a billion dollars. And that was a really good exit because the previous funding round that this company had done a few years back was like only $80 million. So it was like a factor of three. It was fantastic. Um, anyway, so yes. So coming back to the question, um, blood, uh, uh, giving blood. Well, thing is that if you if you take all of the body of data that we have so far it looks like the things that get to be you know bad about old blood and that underpin the benefits that we see by replacing young blood with old, old blood with young blood are not the blood cells rather than the plasma or stuff in the plasma 
So the fact that we are constantly making new blood cells may not itself be, be beneficial. However, of course, when you give blood, you give plasma as well, and new plasma has to be created. So, you know, maybe that, maybe that could be beneficial. Um, the question is whether it's beneficial enough. I mean, you don't give blood every day, um, and, you know, you only get rid of one pint of blood every time, or something like that. So maybe it's not enough, but it could be. Um, so some of, these, some of the work that's been done actually involves injecting young plasma without even taking any old plasma out. And of course, for I guess, physical reasons, there's only a very small amount of young plasma that you can put in without uh, problems if you don't take any out. And yet we still seem to see beneficial effects. So there could be stuff going on there. Uh, I, I, it's honestly too early to, un to give a definitive answer to your question. It's still a great answer. Let's go to Akira, who I think is in Estonia. Hey, Akira. Yes. Yeah, that is right. So I am, I am adapting rapidly to uh, a climate, major climate shift <laughs> coming from <laughs> California. Er, er, Eric Edmeads is there ne uh, next uh, tomorrow, I think. Yeah, yeah. I think we're filming together, actually. I'm helping to produce the, the film shoot. But hi, Aubrey. Thank you for um, everything you've shared here and all your work. And I, I know I read somewhere that you are signed up with cryonics. And I believe, uh, yeah, I know a few people who are also signed up with Alcor. And I'm wondering, um, maybe if you could explain a little bit about what cryonics is. But my question for you is, I mean, what are your expectations in terms of let's say you do go through with the chronics, you're reanimated. I mean, what becomes of your, your identity, your memory, you know, the, that inner, let's just call it the soul or what animates you once you are biologically reanimated. Is this a, right, cheat, yeah. a death cheat, but what happens to you? So uh, for anyone who really hasn't heard of cryonics, and I very much doubt that there's anyone like that on this call, but um, yeah, cryonics is the idea of uh, freezing someone immediately after they have become legally dead, been pronounced dead by a physician. The idea is that um, they're not really dead. Uh, in other words, that they are in a state where they are accumulating damage in their bodies much faster than they were when their hearts were still beating, but still only at a finite rate. So if you do it really fast, then they're only slightly more damaged than they were before they were legally dead. Um, and that may be outrun, so to speak, by improvements in medicine. Um, you know, this is perfectly reasonable medically. Uh, med medics certainly know very well that the concept of death that we think about societally is biologically nonsense. You know, people think people don't like the idea of someone being somewhere between alive and dead. They like people to be either alive or dead and, and that's it. But that's nonsense biologically. Uh, so, and of course there is uh, a, a history of the definition of legal death having been changed by medical practitioners over time because, you know, uh, it used to be just if your heart stopped, that was that. And then, you know, time after time, people, especially kids, would kind of, you know, be, they'd have their heart stopped for maybe an hour where they fell through the ice on a frozen lake and they'd wake up and they'd be totally fine. It became a bit embarrassing, really, for the doctors. Uh, so they had to fix that. Um, uh, yeah, so, so it's perfectly reasonable that if one were beyond the reach of contemporary medicine, one, but only just beyond it, then one might well be within the reach of future medicine. And that's the whole concept of cryonics. So you asked about the soul. Well, I kind of have answered the question, haven't I? Because what I've pointed out is that the whole point of cryopreservation, as it's called, is that uh, you're not really dead. You know, that you are in fact still in a position just like someone in a, in a coma, in a, medic, in a you know, persistent vegetative state or whatever, um, who might actually come back. And, you know, insofar as we believe in the existence of some soul or some non-physical component of what it is to be human, we know that when you're alive, you know, that non-physical component is in some sense trapped in the body, uh, whether or not you're in a coma. Uh, but if you're alive now, then, you know, by definition, you've never been dead, however many letters there are after the name <laughs> of the people who said that you were. Wow. So... Are you doing the full body cryogenics or are you just doing the head cryogenics? Well, first of all, the word cryogenics is the absolute, um, you know, uh, e simplest betrayal that someone doesn't really know what cryonics is. Cry oh. cryogenics. <laughs> uh, right, so um, yeah, cryonics, not cryogenics. Uh, right. So I'm actually signed up for just neuro, which means only my head. Um, 
there are pros and cons there, and I keep it under advisement. Um, the thing is that at the moment, the technology for doing cryopreservation is still very much a research area. It's not as good as it needs to be. Um, because, in other words, more damage is generated during the process of cryopreservation. And of course, in the process of reviving somebody, you would have to repair that damage as well as the damage that caused them to be pronounced legally dead in the first place. So at the moment, the way we can do cryopreservation in, creates less damage if you only um, freeze the head rather than if you freeze the whole body. And that, you know, that's kind of more important than the question of the fact that people would have to build a whole new body because by the time we end up trying to revive people, the theory is that building a whole new body for someone won't be all that difficult. Makes sense. Let's go to Jared. Jared? Hey, well, two questions. The one was on what you talked about before. Are there any reputable services that you can get your biological age tested? And then my other question was about fecal transplants and the validity. And then if there's a way to isolate the, the good stuff, the bacteria or the biome, as opposed to doing the full fecal transplant, can you isolate whatever is the benefit from like a younger, healthier host, someone who's got a long, uh, family history of longevity, and then transplanting that? And it, maybe is there a supplement form, that type of thing, so. Yeah, okay, so um, the uh, first question, biological age. Well, there are a number of groups that test different kinds of things. Uh, you know, they look at, as I say, all of these physiological parameters, you know, things in your blood and so on. Um, there's, there's a number of such groups. The one that I most recently used was Human Longevity Inc. based down in La Jolla. Um, you know, I definitely was um, impressed by the quality of their service. So insofar as I can recommend anybody, I can just talk as a satisfied customer. Uh, but I, I, I assure you that there are others. Um, the uh, uh, question of fecal transplants, well, this is actually another really, you know, um, early stage research area. There are companies out there uh, that uh, provide such, uh, that are very interested in analyzing and optimizing your microbiome, uh, but the science is moving fast. So I would not want to comment confidently with regard to what's really good for you on that right now. Okay, let's go over to John. You got the next question, John. Hi, Aubrey, nice to meet you. Um, I was just curious if you had to rank um, the most basic uh, blocks of like human health, such as like sleep, food, exercise, and breathing, which ones are best uh, for longevity? Well, for sure, breathing is really bad for you. I mean, um, you know, it's definitely the worst thing we do. The, um, uh, the process of extracting energy from nutrients by transferring electrons to oxygen, which is the definition of breathing to a biochemist, um, you know, that is the source of most of the free radicals in the body, which are very act reactive molecules that damage DNA and proteins and everything. So don't do breathing if you can avoid it. Unfortunately, of course, I'm being flippant because you can't avoid it. You've got to do it. It's not the breathing of pollutants or anything. It's the breathing of oxygen that's the problem. And so that kind of consideration is really what led me to the understanding 20 years ago that we should not be trying to slow down, let alone stop, the um, creation of the body's creation of damage. It's going to happen. It's too intrinsically intertwined with the processes that we need to undertake to keep us alive. What we must do instead is to dive in one step down the road and repair the damage that is done as a side effect of metabolism before that damage reaches a level of abundance that causes us to get sick. There you go. You. Rapid fire. Look at him. Let's go to Brandon. Brandon Adams. Hey, Aubrey, thank you so much for your time. Uh, so I, I'm just curious to better understand the cold pool process. So I've been doing the cold hot shower thing for five years now, but I do now four to five days a week where I go into a, a really, I think it's like 30 degrees, kind of like an ice bath for five to seven minutes, uh, four to five days a week. Can you explain, and so everybody else understands too, the benefits for your health of doing that? Yeah, well, okay. So, um, first of all, let me start by saying that I'm not going to um, advocate this as the Holy Grail any more than I can advocate calorie restriction or anything like that. The fact is, you know, the benefits that may accrue from such um, uh, activities are going to be modest. Um, however, the, the underlying biological basis is reasonably well understood now. It's, a, it's an example of what's called hormesis 
which is defined as the response of the body to a temporary stress, something that which, if you had it all the time, would be bad for you. The idea is that when the body is put under some kind of stress, whatever type of stress it may be, in your case, temperature stress, right, um, that the body responds in ways to, you know, to, to minimize the amount of damage that the stress might actually generate. Makes sense. But the cool thing is that that response persists even after the actual stress itself has gone away. And that means that the body is basically working harder than it normally would have bothered to do to minimize the damage accumulation that happens thereafter. So the idea is periodic application of stress may actually be somewhat beneficial overall because the amount of damage that you avoid making in the gaps between the stresses is more than the additional amount of damage that you make during the stress. So should I not do it as much as what you're saying? <laughs> no, that's, that's not what I'm saying, no, because the point is that um, eventually the body does realize that the stress isn't there anymore and therefore it reverts to the low level of maintenance that existed before the first time, before the stress. So the exact um, you know, frequency with which one should do this and the intensity with which one should do it is something that can only be determined by experimentation. But you're saying is if it's common and regular, the body automatically adjusts. So it's not seen as stress anymore. So the... the I, did, I didn't quite say that. I didn't say that it's not seen as stress. I say it is seen as stress, but the process of responding to the stress is not instantaneous. When the stress, uh, when the stress is in, introduced, the response to upregulate the measures to combat the stress, the damage that might be created by the stress is rapid. But when the stress is then removed, the body kind of is rather slow on the uptake when it comes to actually down-regulating the stress response again. All right, let's go over to Sam Morris, one of my favorite human beings on the planet. Uh, Sam, go for it. Hey, Sam. Hey, hey. Well, thank you for being here, Aubrey. Uh, so I have actually a, a personal question because I am paraplegic and I have been for 21 years, but my real disability is not my paraplegia. My real disability is my history of chronic pressure ulcers on my buttocks. And I am wondering what the future of soft tissue engineering is. We see 3D printing for organ transplants and that, so, that sort of thing. But what stands in the way? What are the obstacles in terms of, say, 3D printing viable muscle tissue? Um, well, actually, before I answer your question, what I would like to comment on is something that some people may know about me, but maybe not many. Um, so the whole kind of idea of comprehensive damage repair, the sense paradigm that I pioneered 20 years ago and that um, you know, has now become very mainstream, uh, that whole idea came to me in one kind of instantaneous eureka moment in the middle of the night when I was at a two-day workshop in Manhattan Beach, California, that was organized by a guy named David Kekich. I don't know whether anyone here is familiar with that name, but David is also paraplegic. He, had an in, he hurt himself badly in a, in a gym, actually, uh, when he was, I think, 35. He's now in his 70s. And for a long time, he, you know, he made a little bit of money in, in the financial markets um, when he was younger. And so he used some of that money to try to promote research into paraplegia, um, into spinal cord repair and such like. Um, but eventually he decided, hang on, maybe I'm not really prioritizing the right thing. He realized that even if he manages completely to recover from his injury, he's still going to get sick and die, you know, when, he's, when, he, when he gets old. And he didn't fancy that. So he, he switched his emphasis to aging. And he funded a few people, made, made a small foundation and ran this workshop uh, at which I had this crazy idea. Uh, so that's, that's the history uh, that you reminded me of. And I thought oh, I would mention it. Um, uh, but yes, to come to soft tissue stuff. So yes, you're quite right. Tissue engineering is really moving fast now. Uh, you know, uh, it's, it's got a long and distinguished history, of course. Uh, maybe 25 years ago, there, was real, there were real breakthroughs being made that actually led to a number of companies being created and doing quite well at first. 
But really the science wasn't ready and most of those companies folded. Um, uh, but now the science is really coming into its eye. So <laughs> there's a long way to go. And I think the big thing to emphasize is that tissue engineering is not an isolated thing. It's really intimately um, intertwined with stem cell work, with uh, inducing in situ regeneration of what's already there. And of course, wound healing, including uh, especially um, persistent wounds, is another very big part of all of that. It's, um, you know, it, it's, it, it, it's extremely, um, you know, troubling for people. A lot of suffering is caused by persistent wounds, including ulcers. Um, and uh, so, you know, fixing that would be great. And actually, um, this brings me back to one of the things I mentioned right at the beginning when somebody mentioned Unity Biotechnology. Turns out that senescent cells play a big role in perpetuating ulcers. And we hope that um, there may be progress in allowing them to heal, even outside of classical tissue engineering, uh, by elimination of senescent cells. But a lot going on there. Um, you know, it would take me half an hour more to, to talk about the specifics of the things that are going on. But I think you're entitled, uh, bottom line, I think you're entitled to be optimistic right now. Is there anything that's that very good to hear. preventative right now? Can Sam do anything, uh, in, ingest anything, take anything to help him out with this? Because it is a, it's, it's one of Sam's biggest, it's his, the bane of his existence in most respects at the times. Oh yeah. yeah, like I said, paraplegia itself is just an inconvenience. The, the pressure ulcers is the actual disability. Yeah, I mean, I wish I could help more, but of course, as I mentioned earlier, you know, I'm not an MD, I'm a PhD. So, you know, this right. is not really something where it's my area of expertise. Well, thank um, you for what you have shared. If, if you look at, Aubrey, the animals that live the longest, was it like a, a quan clam or something like that that lives to be 800 years old? I, I believe that's what it is. If we look at these animals that live an extended amount of time, what is happening in their body structure to allow them to live this long, this long period of time? Yeah, the quahog, uh, you know, which everyone can now pronounce because of Family Guy. Uh, that's um, right. That's, that's the main... Um, and a very long-lived clam that people have often studied. Uh, and yes, there are many other long-lived organisms that seem very interesting. And of course, there is a good deal of work uh, trying to figure out how they do it. But what I really should emphasize to this non-biologist audience is that nearly all of those examples are easily seen to be irrelevant to our work to develop medicines for humans. The reason they're irrelevant is because for one reason or another, their biology, their body plan, their, you know, the way that the, what they're made of is different, such that they have a very different type of aging problem in the first place. Mm -hmm. So, for example, uh, cohogs and you know, sea anemones and hydra, these are essentially immortal organisms. But the thing is, they basically don't have a brain. You know, they don't have a central nervous system, at least as we would call it. And, you know, I don't know about you, but I'm quite fond of my central nervous system, and I wouldn't really be too um, keen to uh, sacrifice it in the interest of immortality. So, so that's not really how we should do this. And, it, and unfortunately, it's worse than that. If we come closer to, um, the, uh, to humans in terms, of, uh, in terms of evolution, if we look at, for example, lobsters, which definitely live a long time, or indeed a number of uh, uh, lower vertebrates, fish and uh, amphibians, uh, we often see very long lifespans, even reptiles, um, but they've got something very interesting about them that makes it difficult to, uh, to judge whether it's relevant. Namely, they carry on growing however long they live. They don't have a fixed size in adulthood the way that mammals do. And that turns out to matter a lot, because if you're growing, then you've got to, you know, introduce new cells into every single, uh, single organ of your body all the time. And if you've got to do that, then you've got to have stem cells for those organs that are maintained throughout your life, right? Um, whereas if you've got a fixed body plan like humans, you don't need that. You can just kind of get rid of your ability to regenerate and make new cells and just keep the existing ones going as long as necessary. And as, I, as I'm sure all of you are aware, evolution doesn't care about old people at all because old people have already passed on their genetic information. So evolution in general chooses to just, just, just dispense with the regenerative capacity of certain tissues, like the brain, for example, or the heart, um, because it doesn't need to grow them. 
uh, whereas uh, an alligator, for example, or a, or a fish that grows for, forever, um, you know, the, the, the brain has the ability to introduce new neurons to allow the brain size to grow. Um, and that means that it has the ability to introduce new neurons to replace damaged ones. So, um, you know, uh, that means that aging is a, a much easier problem to solve, so to speak, for an organism like that. Now, there, now, there are types for this. So, for example, there's a type of mammal called a naked mole rat, which is basically about the size of a mouse, but lives about 10 times longer than mice do. And they appear, and they don't have any of this stuff. They do have one thing going for them, which is that they don't breathe much. And I mentioned breathing is really bad for you, right? Um, and these organisms live about a meter underground in the Kalahari Desert, where it's warm all the time, even in the night. You know, the temperature fluctuation between day and night is about one degree Celsius. Um, and so they don't have to do much in terms of keeping themselves warm by burning energy, by making energy. So um, they, um, yeah, so they don't have so much of an aging problem either, but they do have some very interesting things. In particular, they seem to be remarkably, I mean, ridiculously resistant to cancer. And there's been some recent discoveries over the past few years on how that happens. So, um, you, know, uh, you know, we may learn things from long-lived organisms, but we have to be very careful which ones we look at if we really want to learn something useful. All right. Ryan, Ryan Thompson, you got the mic. Go for it, Ryan. Hey, Aubrey, thanks for your time. Um, I, uh, <clears throat> for years ago, I was just chronically fatigued and just kind of uh, not feeling well. And I have uh, some, some autoimmune stuff, Graves disease, um, celiac disease. And um, I was still kind of discovering some of those things. But um, I ended up getting my testosterone levels checked at some point at the recommendation of a friend and, and they were low. Turns out I had some hardware damage um, <laughs> on a long kind of crazy trip down in Chile. And um, I've been on uh, testosterone replacement therapy for the last few years. And I do think it's helped with energy levels and, and, and some things like that. But I'm just wondering about the long-term effects of exogenous hormones. Um, you know, some of these like anti-aging sort of guru types, uh, you know, are, are big proponents of it. But I'm just wondering if there's real science behind that. Yeah, okay. Read my lips. I'm a PhD, not an MD. Yeah, yeah, yeah. sorry. So, no. And of course, what I do know is that everybody's different. So yeah. whether it can help you, what amount can help you, how it can help you, is nothing that I could possibly have an opinion on. Okay, I apologize. <laughs> Someone says, what is your take on Daniel Longo's commercial intermittent fasting po program? Well, first of all, his name isn't Daniel, it's Volta. Um, but yes, the um, intermittent fasting concept definitely has merit. Uh, the idea here is to essentially do what's called calorie restriction in a way that is you know, easier to do. So you don't feel so hungry all the time. Uh, and it has basically the same effect. It keeps your insulin really low, and it probably has health extending and perhaps slight life extending impact. So very much in the same way that people are touting drugs like metformin and rapamycin and resveratrol and, and uh, NAD precursors like NMN. Uh, you know, these are all ways to trick the body into hunkering down, doing more, ma more maintenance naturally than it normally would. And this is something that, you know, it's not very difficult to understand from an evolutionary perspective. Again, it's always good to go back to evolution and thinking about these things. Um, essentially, if you're um, in a famine, you don't want to have kids. You want, because they'll die before they have their own kids. They'll die of starvation. You want to hunker down and get through the famine. So there's, there's, there's this shift of metabolic priorities, shift of which genes are turned on and off in different tissues. And the more you can trick the body into doing that, without having to suffer the indignity of actually starving, um, the, uh, uh, the, the, the healthier you're gonna stay. The only thing, the only caveat is that like everything else that we can do today, the benefits are very, very minimal. They're very, very much less than what you would see in a short-lived organism like a mouse or a rat in the laboratory. You, you said over and over again, I'm a PhD, not an MD. And I'm, does that give you a different type of freedom also? that being a PhD allows you to have a, 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 a less structural way of going after something to where you're able to 
I'm, I'm just curious because it's, 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 an interesting, it's an interesting way of putting it. Uh, I definitely wouldn't call it less structured. I would say that it's kind of you know there's a symbiosis here. There's a, it, 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 there's teamwork between the MDs and the PhDs. Um, the MDs have their hands full figuring out what is the best thing to give someone out of the range of things that already exist. Mm -hmm. And the PhDs are out there trying to expand that range. Um, right. But I think we both have to be very structured. You know, uh, one thing I would say, actually, there are, I would subdivide the PhD category in a rather important way. So a lot of research, and I would go so far as to say the overwhelming majority of research into aging at the time that I came into the field 25 years ago, is um, what I, what, what's often called curiosity driven. In other words, people don't really think about the humanitarian benefit of the work they're trying to do. They just do it because, you know, there's a question there and they want to know the answer just for the sake of knowing the answer. And the reason why we're willing to give those people money is basically, uh, as a society, right, is because every so often they get lucky and they find something out that does have humanitarian benefit. But the honest truth is that most such people do not regard that as their problem or their job. My ex-wife, who got me into this field, is exactly one of these people. She's very much a curiosity-driven scientist. And that's why she never thought that aging was, a partic was particularly her problem. Um, so I'm very much a goal-directed kind of person, a technologist. I don't think that way. But yet, I'm very much focused on stuff that does not yet exist, on developing new tools that are better than the ones we have today. And let's go with that. Let's just say you are able to pull off what does not exist to have it exist. What does life look like when you have what you want? To, that's legitimate. It's reality. Well, or more to the point, when we all have what I want us to have. Yep. Right. Uh, well, of course, the way we would be is as a society in which we have a very much larger number of people who are chronologically old, but essentially nobody who is biologically old. Um, and that's quite nice, really, because, of course, we know that in across the whole industrialized world, the overwhelming majority of ill health is, as, is the result of age-related pathologies that essentially don't affect people who are young adults. Um, and therefore, they're parts of aging. You know, they shouldn't be called diseases. They should be called parts of aging. And, you know, this is just, they're just not going to happen anymore. Um, and, of course, the developing world is catching up pretty fast. The average longevity in the whole world these days is 73. You know, so it's less than a decade below the number one countries, the really long-lived countries. Um, so, yeah, that's where we're going to be. We're going to be in a world in which people can live as long as they like without getting sick. Wow. And being sick, not common cold, you're talking about things that are degenerative and things that are destructive. That's right. Cancer. As well as getting colds and COVID and so on, because of course the decline of the immune system is a big part of that. People will get uh, infections, same as young people do, but they will recover from those infections just as quickly and as thoroughly as young people do. So how do we help? Is it just money? Is that all you need? Honestly, it is, but of course that can be um, achieved in multiple ways, some direct and some indirect. Anyone who has the ability to write big checks, absolutely. The more the, 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 this is the best way to make an impact on, um, a, a, on the quality of life of humanity in general. And so anyone who wants to be what's often called an effective altruist, you know, this is the way to do it. The bang for the buck is just absolutely unparalleled. Um, but of course, there is much more than that. There is advocacy. Essentially, even today with an industry in this space that's growing rapidly. Um, uh, still, the bulk of the money that actually supports this work comes from the government. And the government is controlled by people who have exactly one priority in life, which is to get reelected, which means that public policy always follows public opinion rather than leading it. So at the end of the day, everybody, however wealthy you are, who, whatever your situation, everybody can simply educate their family, their friends, their colleagues. If you're Ken, you can get me on a webcast and I can do something like this. You know, um, everybody can do something. And the more we do this, the more we raise the quality of people's understanding of what this is all about and banish the ridiculous falsehoods that still dominate people thinking about aging. The idea, for example, that um, if we could treat aging, then people would just spend a long time in a poor state of health at the end of life. You know, if we can banish those things, then 
this will happen a lot faster and a huge number of, number of lives will be saved. How many the only other thing I want to say in elaboration of that is yeah. there is a big industry coming now. The industry is growing fast. We've touched on a couple of examples of companies that are doing well, but it's very unevenly distributed. The process of rejuvenation, of damage repair in the body is a divide and conquer um, enterprise. Different types of damage need different technologies. Some of them inevitably are more difficult to repair than others. So uh, that means that some of these technologies have moved into the private sector very effectively and are getting, you know, they don't really have much of a funding problem anymore. But other ones are at an early stage and are still relying on organizations like Sense Research Foundation on philanthropic support. And that, unfortunately, is very much not growing at this point. We are still really hurting to get enough money done. And lives are going to be lost as a result of things at this point going slower than they could if science were the only limiting factor. In how many years would you like to extend on someone's life? What would you like well, to see? Okay, so I really want to emphasize that that's the wrong question. That longevity okay. is a side effect of health. And we don't work on longevity at all. We work on health. We just do medical research. So I think personally, it's crazy to have an opinion about how long one wants to live. It's like having an opinion about what time you want to go to the toilet next Sunday. You know, I mean, you may have an opinion about what time you're likely to go to the toilet because of habit, but having an opinion about what time you want to go, it's crazy because obviously you know that you're going to have more information on the topic nearer the time and you're going to be able to act on that information. So, um, so no, I don't know. I don't have the faintest idea whether I actually want to live to 100. You know, I just know that I want to be able to make the decision when I'm 99 rather than having that decision progressively taken away from me by my declining health. You mentioned Ray Kurzweil, and he, of course, is all around the singularity. What do you think about the idea of, as opposed to coming back with the same body, but, but just coming back with your, the consciousness of you? Any thoughts of that? Yeah, so, I mean, okay, the, the devil is in the detail here. The idea of revival of somebody who has been cryopreserved poorly, in other words, the process of cryopreservation has introduced a huge amount of additional damage over and above the damage that killed them, right? You know, that can only be done by the, what you just described, by uploading, as it's often called. Um, and some people are kind of more or less okay with that. They think, you know, well, okay, it's going to be a different hardware, but that's okay. Um, a lot of people are not okay with it. They think, you know, it kind of is not, it's just a copy of the person. It's a bit like making a, cl a, 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 you know, a clone. Um, you know, I'm not, I don't really have a strong opinion on this, but certainly I enjoy being made out of meat and I would prefer continuation of identity. You know, I would prefer not to have a problem here. But that doesn't completely answer the question because if we look at uploading, we have to look at how it's done. What kind of um, actual procedure would be involved to transfer one's personality, one's consciousness to different hardware? And really, the question of continuity of identity comes down to how, st how stepwise that process is performed. In other words, if it's done in a lot of small steps, then maybe continuity of identity is maintained because you end up, you know, just with, let, let's say you put in 1% uh, of the, you replace 1% of the neurons in a current brain, in a completely biological brain with artificial neurons that are made of silicon, right? And those new neurons, you know, the, the person is still, it's just like having had a liver transplant or whatever, that's still the same person. And those new neurons will learn from the old ones, from the 99%, and they will become incorporated into the, into the individual's cognitive network, so to speak, so that when you replace the next 1%, the first 1% will be doing the teaching as well as the learning, so to speak. And, um, you know, eventually you'll have replaced all 100%, and you won't have had any moment where everything switched. That's right. Aubrey, if we can help you out again, the website is? The website is sense.org. S for September, E for elephant, N for November, S for September.org. And lots of information there. Um, very much hope it will be useful to everybody. Thank you so much for giving us your time, your energy, and your ideas. And really, really appreciate you being part of the metal community. Well, it's my pleasure, too. Thank you, Ken, for having me on the show. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.